Rule of Law Institute of Australia, uh, and Cyprical, has hosted a Rule of Law conference in Brisbane. Uh, and uh, I thank the organisers and the distinguished panel of speakers and chairs for their dedication to a topic of such fundamental importance to our society. This phrase of three words, the rule of law, encapsulates a wealth of principle, some binding, some aspirational. And there lies the dilemma, because the rule of law is often ignored or promoted at the whim of those who use it uh, for their own political purposes. My personal concern uh, is with the rule of law being undermined by virtually unlimited delegation of legislative power to the executive in some areas, by incomprehensible legal drafting in some cases, and by a complex legal labyrinth of rules. Its opposite, the rule of men, is only encouraged by these practices. And recently I undertook some research which revealed to me the complexity of the Prussian Code of 1794, with its 17,000 sections, uh, which led to all the lawyers in Prussia simply ignoring it. So it is necessary for those who appreciate the significance of the rule of law to highlight its principles, for those who can protect it to nurture it, and for those who should observe it to declare their commitment to it. And this conference, I'm sure, will achieve those noble objectives. So I declare the conference open, uh, and I also chair the first session. So it's my great pleasure to uh, welcome the first speaker, Senator the Honourable George Brandis. Um, and the first session is entitled The Australian Parliament and the Rule of Law. And as all of you know, I'm sure, uh, Senator Brandis is the Shadow Federal Attorney General and Deputy Leader of the Opposition in the Senate. He needs little introduction to this audience, but we should note him as a distinguished alumnus of, uh, of the University of Queensland, both in Arts and Law with First Class Honours uh, and a scholarship to uh, do his BCL at Oxford. He began at the Brisbane Bar in 1985 where he established a successful commercial practice and took silk in 2006. In May 2000, he was chosen to fill a casual Senate vacancy in Queensland and was returned in 2004. He served as the Minister for the Arts and Sport from 2006 to 2007 and was re-elected to the Senate in 2010. Uh, and I was fascinated to read recently his comments in relation to the recognition of Sharia law or the, or the need to recognise Sharia law in relation to wills particularly. So we look forward to, and I invite Senator Brandis to take the, the lectern. essential requisites of a free and civilised society. Indeed, the gradual evolution of mankind to despotic forms of governance in which subjects enjoyed no protection from the arbitrary whim of members of the governing class, to societies in which arbitrary power is constrained by known and settled rules of general application, so that those who govern are subject to the same laws as every other citizen is the story of the development of civilization itself. However, like so many other essentials of our civilization which we tend to take for granted, freedom of speech and freedom of the press are other examples, it is by no means as firmly fixed in our legal firmament as we assume. While the remark, the price of liberty is eternal vigilance, has become a desk calendar cliché, nevertheless reminds us of a very powerful truth, that we must always be on our guard against the erosion of existing freedoms, often unwitting, usually gradual, so that each tiny step seems of itself to be of no great consequence, and at least in modern Western democracies, almost always undertaken by legislators, bureaucrats and regulators with the very best of intentions. 
it is to be a sentinel against such erosion, and in particular the erosion of the rule of law, that this institute exists. And its work has never been more important than it is today, when a culture of consequentialism, in which the end that justifies the means, so that the principled adherence to the rule of law is routinely abandoned in favour of what are deemed to be socially desirable outcomes, seems increasingly to be the spirit of the age. When I was studying jurisprudence at Oxford 30 years ago under the tutelage of Professor Joseph Raz, he introduced me to the Storrs Lectures, delivered at Yale Law School in April 1963 by the great American legal scholar Long Fuller, and later published as The Morality of Law. It is one of the most satisfying and persuasive works of legal philosophy I have ever read. It excited me then, and it has shaped my thinking about the rule of law ever since. Professor Fuller's argument, which in some respects anticipates Joe Raz's own later work, in particular the concept of a legal system, is that regardless of the substantive content of particular laws or the prevailing social philosophies which those laws embody, the very idea of a society governed by laws necessarily implies not just its own inner logic so that there are some things which every legal system which deserves the name has in common, but its own intrinsic morality as well. In Fuller's words, legal morality can be said to be neutral over a wide range of ethical issues. It cannot be neutral in its view of man himself. To embark on the enterprise of subjecting human conduct to the governance of rules involves, of necessity, a commitment to the view that man is or can become a responsible agent, capable of, capable of understanding and following rules, and answerable for his defaults. Every departure from the principles of the law's inner morality is an affront to man's dignity as a responsible agent. It also follows that every legal system necessarily enshrines certain common principles. These principles we might collectively regard as the rule of law. Professor Fuller identified eight of them. The first and most fundamental, to which I've already made reference, is generality. The existence of rule-based governance rather than the exercise of public power in an arbitrary and ad hominem manner. The second is transparency, so that the laws are known to, or at least reasonably knowable by, those who are required to obey them. The third is prospectivity. Since a citizen can only be expected to govern his conduct by rules of which he is aware, so retrospective lawmaking is not merely unjust, it attacks the very integrity of the rule of law itself, since it puts any prospective law under the threat of retrospective change. The fourth principle is comprehensibility. This is a particular aspect of transparency. A law must be so expressed that a citizen is, a, is capable of understanding his rights and obligations under it. Of course, there will always be argument about the definition and content of particular laws, but there is a difference between the inevitable uncertainty that comes from complexity and obscurity. One has only to think of the darker passages of the Income Tax Assessment Act, of which if I might adapt the language of Charles Dickens uh, in his description of Jarndyce and Jarndyce, no two revenue lawyers can talk about for more than five minutes without coming to total disagreement about all of the premises. By the way, it was not ever thus. Sir Robert Garron, who as the Secretary of the Commonwealth Attorney General's Department in the 1930s, supervised the drafting of the Income Tax Assessment Act 1936, once described it as, quote, a thing of beauty and simplicity that would not have shamed Wordsworth or T.S. Eliot. <laughs> he was speaking, of course, of the original iteration of the Act, which ran for all of 81 pages. Today, it is more than 25 times as long, notwithstanding the repeal during the Howard government of hundreds of pages of obsolete provisions, 
and the relocation of many of the machinery provisions in the original Act to separate statutes. The fifth of Professor Fuller's principles is consistency. Contradictory laws, or laws which dictate contradictory obligations, strike at the heart of the rule of law because they make law-abiding conduct literally impossible. The sixth of Fuller's principles, which is an aspect of the fifth, is capacity for compliance. Legal rules cannot reasonably require conduct beyond the capacity of the party affected by them. An aspect of this is the imposition of a liability in circumstances which no conduct or compliance strategy by a citizen could reasonably avoid. So rather than a rule by which the citizen can guide his conduct, such so-called laws become, in effect, a form of compulsory social insurance. The seventh principle is stability. No system based upon the rule of law can long withstand changes to the law so frequent that the citizen cannot reasonably orient his action by them. Fuller's final principle is congruence. There must be reasonable congruence between the rules as announced and the rules as administered. The lack of congruence between laws as written and their administration is a particular vice where so much of the citizens' legal obligations are to be found in the exercise of administrative and ministerial discretions. As Professor Fuller writes, a total failure in any one of these eight principles does not simply result in a bad system of law. It results in something that is not properly called a legal system at all. And yet, as a lawyer who decided perhaps foolishly to become a legislator, I see each and every one of those principles violated all the time. I hasten to add that both sides of politics bear some of the responsibility for this. The eagerness of politicians to make new laws and promulgate new regulations is boundless and accelerating. I'm amused when I hear the Prime Minister or her apologists regularly proclaim as evidence of the success of the Hun Parliament the number of new acts which have been passed. Nobody ever thinks of pointing to the number of acts which have been repealed as a measure of success. In January 2006, the report of the Task Force on Reducing Regulatory Burdens on Business, established within the Productivity Commission by the then Treasurer Peter Costello, reported that since 1990, in other words, in the space of the previous 15 years, the Commonwealth Parliament had passed more pages of legislation than the entire body of Commonwealth statute law in the history of Federation until 1990. That time span included, of course, periods of both Labor and coalition government. It might also interest you to know that taking into account the three levels of government, according to the Productivity Commission, there were approximately 24,000 different types of licenses dealing with the various activities of those engaged in business and the professions. Excessive and burdensome legislation obviously offends several of the principles of proper lawmaking of which Longfellow spoke. However, the vice is not limited merely to the volume of legislation. There are three other bad legislative practices, each in their own way offensive to the rule of law, properly understood, to which I want to make reference in the time left to me. Of course, this is by no means intended to be an exhaustive list of bad legislative practice, but it will suffice to whet your appetites. I begin with the invidious practice of which I again can see that neither side of politics is innocent of legislation by press release. This often happens when the minister issues a statement foreshadowing legislation. Of course, the announcement is not an, ena an enactment. However, the bill which it foreshadows is commonly made retrospective to the date of the announcement. The consequence is that a press release will be treated as law in effect before the law is passed. The Minister's announcement requires the people to act in accordance with policy despite it not yet being legislated. That practice offends not only the rule of law, but can as well violate the separation of powers 
A good example is a decision last year, is seen in a decision last year of the full federal court, ESO Australia against the Commissioner of Taxation, where the ATO requested an adjournment because the Minister had announced the introduction of legislation which would render any court findings redundant by virtue of the Bill's proposed retrospective operation. The court rejected the ATO's request and quoted with approval these words from the New South Wales Court of Appeal in Megalit Overseas and Grigbo. Quote, the courts are charged with the high responsibility of administering justice according to the law as it is. A party invoking the jurisdiction of the court must be permitted to seek the justice upon that basis and the court cannot deny him that right because of a reasonable expectation that at some future date the law will be changed and with that change that his rights according to the law might also be changed. In a further reminder about the observance of the separation of powers, the court also noted that the Minister's announcement could be viewed as presumptuous in light of the fact that it came from a government with a parliamentary minority. The second bad legislative practice to which I wish to refer is the growing use of Henry VIII clauses, which, might I remind you, are statutory provisions which declare that if there is an inconsistency between regulations made under an enactment and the terms of the enactment itself, the regulations, not the enactment, will prevail. Provisions of that character, called Henry VIII clauses in the historical memory of the fact that that monarch persuaded the feeble parliamentarians of his day to cede to him powers to make law by proclamation, amount in effect to a legislative sanction to the executive government to amend or even repeal the provisions of an act of parliament. A recent example of this practice arose in the uh, context of the federal government's legislation to mandate so-called plain packaging of tobacco products. The opposition decided to support the legislation. However, we opposed a related bill, the Trademarks Amendment Tobacco Plain Packaging Bill, which introduced a Henry VIII clause into the legislative scheme. The bill provides that in the event of inconsistency between the Trademarks Act and regulations in relation to, to tobacco products made under the Act, the regulations would prevail. The government's justification for the clause in the Trademarks Bill was to provide that, and I read here from the explanatory memorandum, if in the future it is necessary, the government can quickly remedy any unintended interaction between the Tobacco Plain Packaging Act and the Trademarks Act that cannot be dealt with under the Tobacco Plain Packaging Act. The government may have had in mind a successful challenge to the principal legislation in making those somewhat cryptic remarks, but it did not expand on them meaningfully. The coalition voted against the bill, that bill, that is the uh, associated bill, on the basis of the offence of Henry VIII clause that was defeated by the government with the support of the Greens. I might add that the coalition's opposition to the Henry VIII provision was, for unworthy and intellectually dishonest political motives, represented by the government's apologists to be opposition to the plain packaging legislation scheme itself, which of course it was not. Legislation by press release and the use of Henry VIII clauses are different aspects of the same much broader issue to which Professor Carney adverted in his introductory remarks. The increasing delegation of legislative power to ministers. <coughs> this is, of course, a familiar problem whose growth is very much parallel to growth in the size and responsibilities of the state since the Second World War. The first and most comprehensive critique of the growth of delegated legislative power was that magisterial work by the great Sir Carlton Allen, Law and Orders, first published in 1945, the same year, by the way, as the election of the Attlee government, that glad, confident morning of the welfare state. The task force on reducing regulatory burdens on business found that the volume of Commonwealth and state subordinate legislation including regulations, statutory rules, ministerial declarations having the force of law, tax rulings and other species of delegated instruments 
having the effect of law, was too numerous to count, that it probably ran into millions of pages. This is, of course, a direct threat to the principles which I have stated, leaving to one side, side the further and acute issue of the costs of compliance. The final area of bad legislative practice to which I wish to refer is the, is the rapid and often little remarked growth of ever more invasive powers by Commonwealth regulatory agencies. I refer in particular to the Australian Competition Commission, uh, Competition and Consumer Commission, the Australian Securities and Investments Commission, and the Australian Taxation Office. The powers are broadly similar in that these agencies can, by notice, compel individuals and corporations to provide information, produce documents, and give evidence, and, give evidence. and the legislation in its various respects abrogates long-standing privileges. However, the triggers for issuing the notices, the administrative guidelines attending them, the right to legal representation, the, and, the, and the mode of claiming privilege and the extent of the use and the extent of use and derivative use immunities are all subtly but importantly different across the different acts of, which govern the agencies. In May 2008, following a reference from the Howard government, the Administrative Review Council published a major report on the coercive information gathering powers of government agencies, which called attention to this problem and made a number of important recommendations for reform of the law governing the various regimes applicable to coercive information gathering powers by Commonwealth agencies. It will surprise nobody if I tell you that nothing happened with the Administrative Review Council's report in the four years since it was published. I take the opportunity of this address this morning to announce that a coalition government, if elected, will revive the report of the Administrative Review Council and seek comprehensively to reform the law in this area with the objectives of achieving consistency, certainty, and the restoration of traditional rights and privileges of the citizen. Too often, politicians, regulators, and bureaucrats feel that the primrose path to making the world a better place lies in ever greater legislation, prescription, and regulation. By gradual degrees, every one of those provisions erodes our freedoms, and in the process, by seeking to make ever more specific provision for the endless variety of human affairs, threatens the very principles of the rule of law itself. Or to end, as I began, with the wisdom of Professor Long Fuller, though an aloof justice is bound at times to be harsh and intimate justice, seeking to explore and grasp the boundaries of a, a private world, cannot, in the nature of things, be even-handed. The law knows no magic that will enable it to transcend this antinomy. The law may know no such magic, and politicians are hardly likely to be wiser than jurists. However, it does lie with politicians to begin to redress this problem, and that redress begins with the unfamiliar and unwanted practice of legislative self-restraint. Thank you.